What is up, everybody? 7.30 on the dot, Ryan Talbot. I said we are going at the absolute turn of the hour hand as we get into this thing right away at 7.30. I did not want to keep everybody waiting. Thank you so much for watching on this Wednesday night. The Staples Show is Ryan Talbot, Matt Perino, the Shout Buffalo Football Podcast, brought to you by Tops Friendly Markets, your, your neighborhood store with more. And actually, whether you're celebrating this weekend, it's a big game. We're going to talk a little bit about it uh, at home or away, wherever you are. Tops Friendly Markets has all your fan favorites ready to enjoy for football, entertaining or any occasion. Get to Tops this weekend. I'm going to bring in my man, Ryan Talbot. How you feeling tonight, buddy? Hey, I'm feeling good. Like you said, staple show, big game this weekend. So really looking forward to, uh, you know, starting to talk about that game a little bit tonight. We have a great guest coming in soon. So I'm, I'm pumped up over here, Matt. Great guest. Let's, uh, let's lock them in here. Let's bring them into the, into the program from CBS sports, Chris Trapasso, our good buddy. We talk about this, uh, before the draft when we had you on and you're like, Listen, man, I'm available. Come on every any time. And I'm like, we have not had enough Chris Trapasso in our life. So we're getting you <laughs> in here tonight. We're going to talk some bills, uh, some AFC, pretty much everything. How are you, my friend? I'm doing really good. Thanks for having me uh, again. And I've probably been in enough of your lives if you're on TikTok. That's been my new yes. favorite platform for film breakdowns, draft, mostly NFL. Um, so seeing those and then inviting me onto this, I feel honored. Thanks, guys. What, right. what a transition. So <laughs> fine. Chris Trapasso. He's absolutely killing the game on TikTok right now. I'm an avid subscriber. I I'm scrolling uh, through his videos on a daily basis. He's breaking down film. He's got a lot of fun little videos. He put up one that really creeped me out because he was rocking a mustache and it took me off. It took me by surprise, <laughs> but it, he, he, he pulled it off. <clears throat> but, but Ryan, what were you saying before we came on here about TikTok? I just said I'm not hip enough to have that. I, you know, I have uh, nieces and nephews that have that, and they're doing their little dance moves in the background. I'm like, yeah, this, this isn't for me. Now, I've watched a ton of your videos, Chris, that you've brought over to Twitter, and they're informative. They're awesome. I'm just, I just feel like I'm at that point where I'm not hip enough to even download it on my phone. Yeah, I'm not going to say that I'm hip enough either. Uh, I think <laughs> I just downloaded it because a lot of people said, like, told me there were so many funny videos on there, like outside of the dance video. So like, I think maybe during the pandemic I downloaded it or like the year before and I was on it a lot uh, at the outset of the pandemic. And then I just realized how easy it is to make like really cool videos with editing abilities and music. So I don't, I don't think you need to be super hip, but Ryan, I think you're a pretty hip guy. So you could definitely be on there. Well, thank I, you. I agree with you, Chris. I don't think it's about the hipness level. I think it's just about the determination. And I think Ryan just has to step up his exactly. determination level a little bit. Yeah. You know, try something yeah. new and get on the mm -hmm. get on the platform. And you can start yeah. with Chris Trapasso. All right. So listen, we have a ton of stuff that we want to get into tonight. But I think before we, you know, dive too deep into this Sunday's game, I want to start with what's going on with this team in Orchard Park today. And if you haven't seen it yet, I mean, it is a pretty lengthy injury report for the Bills. Uh, we'll go through it kind of step by step, but a big name that everybody was talking about, you know, coming out of the Houston game was Matt Milano, who suffered a hamstring injury. I feel like every year about this time, a couple games in the season, he's usually dealing with something and this time around. It's a, it's a hamstring again. Um, let me play this clip first before we talk too much about it. He did not practice today. I asked Tremaine Edmonds after uh, practice about the potential of playing without him again. And here's what Tremaine Edmonds will, said. We'll talk about it in a second. I know it's only Wednesday, but if Matt Milano can't play, how much more do you put on yourself this weekend you know, without him there? Yeah, uh, you know, the status on him, I don't think nobody knows right now. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I want to have him out there. Uh, everybody wants to have him out there. But, you know, he has to do what's best for him at the end of the day. Uh, but, you know, like I said, it's still early, so it's kind of hard to make those, you know, um, assumptions or, you know, but, uh, you know, I just want him to get healthy, whatever way that is. If that's this week, next week, I just want him to be healthy when he comes back. If he can't play, what uh, do you, strengths do you think A.J. brings to the table? Yeah, A.J.'s obviously, you know, uh, you know, a guy that's been in the business for a long time. Uh, he's played a lot of ball. Uh, he's very smart, uh, student of the game. And, you know, just hearing this side of it, and, you know, obviously he's athletic as well. Um, so it's just now it's about going out and executing. Uh, I know he'd be excited, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, but it's just about putting a good week of practice together and, you know, good week of communication and just going out and execute. 
So, Chris, let's start with your, your, your first of all, your initial reaction to, you know, the fact that Milano's hurt again and the potential of playing without him in what's, you know, I know the Bills are talking about it's the next game, the biggest game because it's the next game. This is the biggest game of the season. Yeah. Not having Matt Milano is not ideal. Well, if we remember back to last year, they didn't have Matt Milano in that regular season game in Buffalo against the Chiefs, and there were moments, especially in the run-pass option game early on, against Patrick Mahomes, where what Tremaine Edmonds said is not crazy. I mean, I guess A.J. Klein is athletic, but relative to Matt Milano, he's not very athletic, and you need as much athleticism on the field uh, as you can get when you're facing the Chiefs, of course. For Milano, it, it is starting to kind of pop up every season. The one thing I will say that is, I think, on the positive side for this is that I think part of the reason why the Bills have been in the whole Sean McDermott era relatively healthy like each season like collectively is that they they don't rush guys back like there's been times where a guy's been injured we think it's just um, a minor tweak and Sean McDermott will say hey this is more like weeks than it is days but McDermott said today that it was day for day by day for these guys so I think to hear that from Sean McDermott who is always smart uh, with talking to the media, especially um, when it comes to injuries, that was an encouraging sign for Matt Milano's um, availability. And I think at this point, he was a 2017 draft pick. Like, I don't know if he's to the Kyle Williams, Jerry Hughes level, Emmanuel Sanders level of getting veteran rest days, but I don't know how much Matt Milano necessarily needs to practice, being that he's in his fifth year in this uh, defensive scheme. I think he knows where to be and knows the challenges that are presented by the Chiefs offense. You know, one of the things, Ryan, that has gone so well for this defense this year is the step that Taron Johnson has taken. And I think that, you know, it's funny. I'm doing a story on him for Saturday, uh, the weekend big feature uh, that I'm trying to do every week on one player. And this week it's Taron Johnson because you go back to that, uh, Kansas City game last year and I mean he was up close and personal with Tyreek Hill watching him absolutely go off in that game and one of the things that was interesting that he said so far this week in some of our chats is that you know he in a lot of ways because the of the defense the Bills play he does a lot of the same things that Matt Milano does and so getting him back at practice this week he was there full go I, he missed the last week's game because of the groin injury but he was full go today that is a good sign. But without Matt Milano on Sunday, potentially, what's the impact in this game? No, oh, I, I think it's a significant impact if he doesn't play. Listen, uh, Tremaine Edmonds said everything right in terms of A.J. Klein being a veteran. There's certain things that he does pretty well getting after the quarterback, but you don't want to see him necessarily in, in coverage too much. Uh, if he plays smaller with an, you know another defensive back out there or whatever you try to do to adjust to, to a loss of a Matt Milano, that would just open up a hole somewhere else for Patrick Mahomes and that offense to exploit and to attack. And, and listen, they're, they're very savvy. Um, the offense, I, I think this is going to be a really good offensive battle, but having Taron Johnson out there would be great for this Bills team. It, it would be huge. And then obviously Matt Milano as well. So Taron Johnson obviously looks like he's going in the right direction, being a, a full participant today, uh, dealing with that groin injury as good as Cam Lewis was last week. You, you want to get him back in this lineup. And then if you can get Matt Milano and you feel like he is healthy, that is just so big for a defense that, in my opinion, is playing some of the best ball that they've they've done it through the entire Sean McDermott tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, Milano out today. Taiwan Jones dealing with a hamstring as well. Obviously a special team's concern if he can't go. And then Greg Rousseau, who pops up, apparently suffered a toe injury in the game against Houston. And that raises your eyebrows a little bit because we know one of the big talking points, Chris, when they drafted Greg Rousseau was with the Chiefs in mind, being able to affect the really good quarterbacks in this league with your pass rush. What have been your impressions of Rousseau so far? What would be your expectations if he could play this Sunday uh, and what he can do maybe against this Kansas City Chiefs offensive line, who I've been a little bit less than impressed with through the first four games? Yeah, I mean, we have to remember that the Chiefs revamped their entire offensive line, like five new starters up front. There's two rookies, Creed Humphrey uh, and Trey Smith, who've actually played very well. But Orlando Brown, the big trade that they made in the offseason, from the film I've watched, he's looked like a little bit of a liability at left tackle, the right tackle, uh, even more of a liability. Moving to Rousseau, I think, like the entire Bills defensive line, he was good against the Dolphins, and that is mm -hmm. one of the still bottom-level offensive lines in the NFL. 
What I like that I've seen from Gregory Rousseau beyond just everything that he and AJ Epinesa mostly did in that game, even Jerry Hughes as well. Um, he's playing with a lot more power than I expected. He's setting a strong edge. He's not letting running backs get outside him. Uh, and of course he's still probably in the 255 to 260 range. He can add more weight to his frame as he continues on. He hasn't been a great pass rusher. There hasn't been a lot of pass rushing moves strung together, a lot of bull rushes back into the quarterback, but there is something to be said for uh, his ability to do two things, finish some of those pressures from his teammates. Like we've seen early this season that he's gotten a couple sacks as that cleanup guy. And really that's a big reason why he had those 15 and a half sacks as a uh, red shirt freshman at Miami, that he's so long, he's so tall that he can get those quarterbacks to the turf when maybe some smaller, not as lengthy edge rushers can always sack them. And, at six foot seven, I mean, all it takes is for him to raise his hands as he's chasing down Patrick Mahomes on a bootleg to tip a pass, and that could be the difference in the Chiefs moving the ball down the field and scoring or potentially getting a, a pass breakup or an interception. So I think low-key, even though he hasn't been amazing to start, Gregory Rousseau uh, is actually a pretty big component of what the Bills need to do to stop Patrick Mahomes. Chris, speaking of young Bills pass rushers, we finally got to see Boogie Bash make his debut last week. Uh, obviously had a sack in the game. What were your first impressions of watching Boogie on, on film or even live in that game? Yeah, um, a lot of power to his game. I mean, he, he looks almost like a defensive tackle out there. And it's interesting that when the Bills put him out there at the end position and they have star Latula lay inside. And even at Oliver, they have a very big front that plays with a lot of power. The sack uh, was more of the coverage variety than him winning one, him winning one-on-one, -on -one, but he did show the ability to disengage from a block. Um, I thought he held his own in the run game. That was kind of a low key strength for him at wake forest. Um, it was really the first time that we'd seen him. And it was, I think good for someone that was inactive the first couple of weeks, a second round pick that they were trying to bring along slowly to get kind of a practice game before Kansas city on the road in prime time. And then Tennessee on the road in prime time. I think uh, it, it might take him still more time to similar to Gregory Russo, be able to win with pass rushing moves in, in under three seconds. Um, but I like the fact that he didn't look overwhelmed and that the power element to his game, that really was, to me, the biggest clear-cut strength that he had at like 275 pounds on the edge showed up in that first game against Houston. You look at the rest of this injury report, and I think I mentioned Taron Johnson being full go. Jordan Poyer with the ankle missed last week. He was limited today, so that's a very good sign. I thought he looked not only in good spirits, but was moving around pretty well in the portion that we were able to watch. So that's definitely good news. Tredavious White pops up with his shoulder. He was in the red non-contact jersey, and you know, you kind of get a little bit nervous here, Chris, because I think one of the big pieces last year in the regular season uh, in, in terms of, you know, they, they obviously struggled against the run. But Tredavious White went through that two week period where he was banged up. He missed the, the, the Titans game. I think that was still kind of lingering in the Kansas City game when he came back and tried to play, you know, just from a tackling perspective, having a healthy Tredavious White is important. Um, how concerning do you find that with him popping up on the injury report early this week? Yeah, I again, I I don't think it's crazy um, in terms of concerning because I, I'm of the belief, and Sean McDermott probably wouldn't agree with me on this, that once guys are in their fourth or fifth or sixth season, especially if they're stars, and I get if someone thinks like, hey, stars shouldn't get special treatment, I don't really necessarily think that they need to be full participants in practice or getting in for any practice at all. I mean, we see those guys get the veteran rest days later on, but definitely, I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to sell this short. The bills need all the defensive talent they need in this game on Sunday night football against the chiefs. And adding to that injury report and flipping it to the other side of the ball, another rookie was listed on that injury report, and that's Spencer Brown with a knee injury. You know, Spencer Brown, uh, early in the season, he was getting some limited reps, and he was flashing to the point where the Bills put him in the starting lineup uh, last week. One, how big of a loss would it be if, you know, th this hampers Brown's play? And two, what are your first impressions so far of what you've seen from Spencer Brown early in the season? Well, I don't know if, if anyone can make a legitimate determination how big Spencer Brown being out would be because what lineup are the Bills going to go with on Sunday night on their offensive line? They, they get like 
just mentioned it earlier with Boogie Basham. They get kind of a warm up game against the Houston Texans at home, moving Darrell Williams inside, Spencer Brown at right tackle. Is that going to be the offensive line moving forward? Or once John Feliciano comes back, we assume he's going to reassume his starting role. How do they feel about Cody Ford? Was that just a wake up call? He gets benched for a game. Um, or are they going to reinsert him into the lineup? Because I think Darrell Williams is a little bit of an awkward fit at guard. I will say this re watching the film. Spencer Brown did not look like deer in the headlights. Like he was ready to go. There were some bad losses in pass protection, but there were also some like clear cut wins against Whitney Merciless, uh, who gave Deion Dawkins some problems early in that game and some of the other Texans edge rushers. So to be a third round rookie that didn't play football last season, that is six foot nine and needs to add probably 15 or 20 pounds to his frame. Uh, I thought it was very encouraging from a pass blocking perspective, but kind of going into the philosophy of what the Bills need to do in this game. If you notice from that game on Sunday, they ran the football to the right side of that line a lot. And I thought for being their first time together, of course, Daryl Williams and Spencer Brown did a great job communicating, getting to the second level on combo blocks. They opened up some really big lanes uh, to stop the run. And if the Bills can have long, sustained drives, six, seven, eight, nine minutes, uh, 10, 12, 11 plays, that can really help them uh, you know, keep Patrick Mahomes off the field, shorten the game a little bit so it's not a total track meet in Arrowhead. If you go back, and I did um, this morning, I went back and watched the, the AFC title game. Devin Singletary, there was no Zach Moss. They went with Singletary and TJ Yeldon, who, by the way, I thought TJ Yeldon, you know, it wasn't an impressive stat line, but I thought he 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 made some plays in that game, especially at times when, you know, this offense was struggling. I'm still surprised that he doesn't have a home somewhere, or maybe he does, and I just haven't ca caught on to it, but I know that he was working out for the Saints. Um, Singletary was ineffective in that game. They weren't able to run the ball at all. The Chiefs didn't fear that at all, and I think that's why they were able to really dial things up and send some pressures. I was talking to John Scott uh, from Spectrum News before we left today. I think it was 32 blitzes that uh, Kansas City sent, and you got to be ready for that uh, on, on, on Sunday night, and you got to be confident in Spencer Brown, to your point. I think that they are locked in at Daryl Williams and Spencer Brown, just going off of what Sean McDermott said this week. It seems like they're going to kind of move on from that. It was John Feliciano out there. He was limited today, but it shows that he's progressing toward the end of the protocol. Uh, so we'll see if he comes off that in the next couple of days, and they probably want to give him a shot again. But to your point, he struggled a lot against uh, Chris Jones last year. And yeah. so I think what they're able to do up front, the thing with Spencer Brown that has me a little bit concerned, that knee injury in the Chicago game, I'm wondering if this is the same knees where he's been wearing two huge braces on his knee. He wasn't mentioned before the start of practice today as somebody that was going to be limited in practice, then showed up on the injury report, which has me thinking this might have happened in practice today. Mm. So I think what we what we see tomorrow uh, on the practice field, if he's out there, if he's participating, uh, how it looks at the start, we'll get a better sense of this. But I think what you said about Spencer Brown is, Listen, he didn't look like it was too big for him. Mm -hmm. I thought if you take out Greg Rousseau's performance, you know, uh, against Miami, that was a big time performance on a on a big day. Spencer Brown, I mean, this is one of the better rookie game debuts, if you will, for the Bills in the Sean McDermott era. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think uh, the run game will probably be a bigger factor than it was in that AFC title game. Uh, on Sunday night against the Chiefs, because I think at this point, Devin Singletary, the offensive line, uh, even Zach Moss, they, they're they they're all kind of clicking right now. And this Chiefs defensive front, uh, their entire front seven is a liability. Like there's Chris Jones and not much else. The linebackers um, are not very fast or not that athletic. They're not good at, at getting off blocks. And I'm not going to say that I think they're going to run the ball 40 times and Josh Allen's going to only drop back 25 times. But what Spencer Brown... I think what he's shown and what he's further ahead at right now is blocking for the run. So if he can be out there, I think that's huge for the bills, but it's interesting because Chris Jones, because the chiefs are so thin along their defensive line, he's actually played a lot on the edge this season. And at like six, five and 300 pounds, he's still generating a fair amount of pressure. That's obviously not his natural position. So Everyone needs to be watching out for number 95 on the Chiefs and see where he's lined up because I still think 
even with Spencer Brown out there in his second NFL start, potentially the bills are obviously uh, more capable at the tackle position. So it'll be interesting to see if the chiefs just don't have the horses up front or they say, Hey, we're going to just not worry about the edge rushers and get uh, Chris Jones in those advantageous situations on the inside. Chris, why has the run game been more successful this year? Is it opportunities? Uh, is it the fact that both backs have, have looked like they've rebounded from maybe a, a little bit of a down year last season? Obviously, Moss had his moments last year. I thought Singletary had taken a step back in, in year two. But both guys are looking good despite there being this rotation and riding the hot hand, so to speak. What has been the key to their success through the first quarter of the season? Uh, this is kind of the stock answer, but the run blocking has been better. I mean, Cody Ford in watching the film, his pass protection was really bad the first three weeks, uh, but he was getting after it in the run game on most plays. John Feliciano is, you know, a high energy guy. He's a better run blocker than he is in pass protection. Um, Mitch Morse, I think is a very underrated piece on this entire offense. Uh, he's so fundamentally sound. He's so good on those reach blocks where you have to get across a gap and get a, a a nose tackle turned in the other direction, getting to the second level. And with Singletary and Moss, it's not like they need huge lanes to create because like we saw really against the Houston Texans and in, in every game, Devin Singletary and Zach Moss, they're both really elusive side to side. They're not going to necessarily be burners down the field, although I, I think we can all agree that Devin Singletary looks a lot more dynamic uh, that than he did as a rookie or last year. But when they aren't being contacted in the backfield and they can at least get to the line of scrimmage or a yard or two past it, then they feel a lot more comfortable to sink their hips, bounce to the left or the right. They can absorb contact and continue forward. So I think the whole run game is really in rhythm. The run blocking hasn't been amazing. The backs haven't been phenomenal, but they're just kind of working in tandem together very well. I want to get into some stuff that we heard uh, today, and it's kind of a continuation of what we heard when the Bills got back for you know the, sp the spring work at o OTAs and minicamp. You know, you go back to that game, and it, it looked at times like Josh was a little bit disheveled, a little bit, and you know uh, the pressure was kind of mounting again. Some of the big moments of his career, more so early on in his career, when you know that deer in the headlights look that I think that. You know, it kind of did rear its ugly head at times. And we asked him about it in May and he said, yeah, I mean, it, it was only 17,000 people, but it was loud in there. It was a really hostile environment. And, you know, you think about that and then you kind of fast forward to Sunday and what it's probably going to be like with 73,000 people now in the building. And it's interesting. They've they've been blaring crowd noise, Chris, since they got back in the spring right after the draft. Every practice at some point, we've heard some element of crowd noise and i think that that part of it has been good to prepare for what he's going to be dealing with he said all week long it's about you know checking the protections getting calls in quick making sure that the the lines of communication are open hand signals are understood across the line and this is the first time that they're going to be in a really challenging environment with now emmanuel sanders in the mix and i thought that which from a playing perspective i think is great news because i think he his style of football meshes more with how you know or is a better uh counter attack to the physical brand that kansas city tries to play but how do you anticipate josh being able to handle the hostile environment on, on sunday well based on what we've seen from josh allen and this is like teeing me up for this kind of biggest storyline that i'm going to be watching in this game mm -hmm. in josh allen's career a, a trend that we've kind of seen that that second or third go around of his first moment doing something has usually been pretty good like the first half of his rookie season, I thought he looked like someone that might not even be an NFL backup. And then as he progressed, he played in some hostile environments on the road in Green Bay, uh, settled into that role as, as the Bills starter and their franchise quarterback, looked better. And then in year two, of course, he got a little better. And then last year, got MVP votes. His first playoff game was a little herky-jerky. It was good in the first half, not as good in the second half. Uh, the Bills obviously lose in overtime to the Texans. And then I thought last year in that wild card game, his second playoff game against a really good Colts defense, good defensive line, great linebackers, uh, underrated secondary, he made some big time throws in that game. It was the first game with fans in Orchard Park, of course. I'm interested to see now he faced the Kansas City Chiefs with, like you mentioned, only 17,000, but he admitted 
that it was loud, it was raucous in there, it was to go to the Super Bowl. He seemed a little like, and I always love to use Kyle Brandt's phrase, sugar high Josh Allen in that game. There were still some good throws, but there were times where it was like, oh, that looked like rookie year Josh Allen. I want to see now, okay, I'm back in Arrowhead. It's going to be louder. I've dealt with this before. It's the same team, the same colors. I want to see how he responds. And and in every other moment of his career, uh, up to this point, he's always responded very well after he's gotten a taste of different experiences that come with being an NFL quarterback. You know, that's really well said, Chris. And in addition to maybe Josh being able to improve just based on his last uh, go around, this Chiefs defense statistically is not very good. So, you know, what can you tell maybe Bills fans that uh, haven't been able to watch a lot of the Chiefs games yet? What has been some of the bigger issues with this Chiefs defense so far this year? Well, like I said, the pass rush is Chris Jones and then really no one else. Like, and you could look at the Chiefs roster, and unless you are a draft guy like me, you're not going to really know some of the names. Like, that's mm-hmm. how thin they are up front. The linebackers have been injured, but they're not really that good. They have a rookie, Nick Bolton, that I think early on in the mock draft cycle before the Bills re signed Matt Milano, a lot of Bills fans thought that Nick Bolton from Missouri would be a good, like, late first, early second round pick for the uh, for the Bills. He goes in the third round to the Chiefs. He's a little bit on the slower side. And then the secondary, uh, they have Mike Hughes, who is a former first round pick, but he's a bust uh, that they, they signed from the Minnesota Vikings and a lot of bottom of the roster players. So there's just Tyron Matthew and Chris Jones, and the rest of the defense is not very good. I actually just watched earlier this week the Chiefs against the Eagles, and Jalen Hurts looked like Drew Brees in that game. Like he, I, I was not expecting to see Jalen Hurts, who really has looked kind of like young Tyrod Taylor early in his career, to be comfortable in the pocket, Uh, scanning the field, getting to his third reads, hitting throws at the intermediate level and down the field. There were two throws in that game, both in the red zone that should have been touchdowns that were a little bit outside from Jalen Hurts. Uh, They ultimately ended those drives with field goals. And then a late touchdown to Devontae Smith that would have brought the lead, I think, to only like four points that they called Devontae Smith for illegal touching because he stepped out of bounds in the route. It was down the sideline. Outside of that, like Jalen Hurts almost threw a perfect game. Like he did everything right. They had over 400 yards of offense, almost 500 yards of offense. So they were a little banged up too. I don't know the status of all of their corners and some of their linebackers, but it's really a uh, star-driven group with Chris Jones and Tyron Matthew and the rest of the defense uh, just has been a huge liability this season. It's I'm glad you brought up Jalen Hurts because I thought one of the things that he did really well in that game was getting the ball out of his hands quickly. And I think that Josh is going to need some of those layups early to get himself going, like lean on the run game, get the ball in the hands of your playmakers. I think Isaiah McKenzie sneaky is a guy that could have an impact. He played well in the playoff game last year. Um, But the one thing with Hurts, and I want to ask you about this, and it doesn't apply to the Bills, but just from a quarterback perspective, I think it's interesting. Did he do that at the college level where – Sometimes when the pocket breaks down, he kind of turtles a little bit and kind of starts mm-hmm. like doing this running in place where he kind of is like, you know, doing a little like self circle is kind of awkward. Like it, that's something that I feel like he's got to try to eliminate it from his game. Yeah. That's something where it's like, you got to walk that thin line of, we want all quarterbacks in today's NFL to have that ability to scramble, make plays off script like Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes do better than any quarterbacks in the league, probably them and Russell Wilson but you don't want them to do that as like their second reaction to their first read not being open. I think that's still an issue for Jalen Hurts, and and it did pop up a little bit in that game against the Chiefs, but compared to his first three games where he was really leaning on his legs a lot, took good care of the football, got it out quickly, a lot of easy throws, a lot of rollouts, a lot of screens. Against the Chiefs, he was in the pocket mostly, and yeah, maybe there were some awkward times where he reversed his field, but then he still found open receivers in those scramble drills. So yeah, that's it's something that you want to see a young quarterback not do that frequently. And I think it's still happening a little bit too much with Jalen Hurts. Um, what's not happening too much is is going to Tops Friendly Markets and getting yourself hooked up for the weekend. A lot of football to watch on Saturday and Sunday, and from hot to go pizza and appetizers, signature fried chicken, baby back ribs and subs to delicious salads and brownie trays. Tops has everything you need 
to feed the hungriest fan. Ryan Talbot, there was a there was a trade today in the NFL. Tell yeah, people about you, it. Uh, a former, no, I, I'm not going to say fan favorite, uh, but former <laughs> Bill Stefan Gilmore. Uh, was originally the, the news report he was going to be released by the Patriots, but the Patriots probably, you know, to their credit, put it out there early to see if there were any takers on him. And sure enough, uh, the Carolina Panthers came through with a, I believe, a 2023 sixth round pick. Um, so now he is a member of the Carolina Panthers, which just means that a return to the Bills is eminent. You know, because that pipeline <laughs> from the Panthers to the Bills. So look forward to him in a Bills jersey by 2024. No, and, and you know, in all serious seriousness, I, I thought it was a good move for the Panthers. I, I don't necessarily view them as a Super Bowl contender, but that helps with that defense. It helps with bringing along some young guys that they have in that secondary. Um, it makes them more legitimate in that conference as well. So, and, and once you get in the playoffs, you just never know. So I, you know, I thought it was a good deal considering they had the money. It, the the price was right. I mean, uh, that was the same uh, pretty much draft capital that I, I think the Dolphins received for trading Jakeem Grant. If I if I remember correctly, wasn't it a six round pick that they received for him yep. too? So getting a, mm-hmm. a, a potential lockdown cornerback for the same amount uh, that that's a pretty good deal in my book. It's funny you say potential lockdown cornerback because I got a little bit of a hot take, and I want Chris Trapasso who watches much more film, and by much more I mean he watches film. Than I do. Um, but my my hot take on Gilmore is that. And it would be hot if I went this far with it. And I'm not going to because I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. Maybe it's just it was an offseason. I didn't think he was very good in 2020. Uh, I thought that there were still a lot of good elements to that defense. And I thought that he should have been better. 650 snaps, which is a really good sample size. Three pass breakups, one interception. That's not a lockdown corner. I don't think he w- he was that in 2020. I think off of you know nine to ten months of inactivity, I don't think he's going to be that, especially at the start. I thought that everybody reacting this morning to Gilmore being available and what he could potentially be in a defense. I mean, if he's if he's surrounded by talent, maybe that's one thing. But I think that there's definitely a cap for what Gilmore brings to your defense. Yeah, I agree with you that last year coming off winning the defensive player of the year, he just wasn't the same. And I, it's not really surprising. I was just talking to my dad about this today because he was when he saw the tweet that the Patriots were going to release him. I mean, that would have been more noteworthy if they actually released him than trading him because everyone was like, how could they not get something for Stefan Gilmore? And they ultimately did, although it wasn't much. I was telling my dad that if you're a lockdown press man cornerback, the last two things you want to do are turn 30 and tear something in your lower extremities. You don't want to tear your quad and be 31 years old. So I think mm-hmm. we've seen a lot of these really, really good on an island quarterbacks like Darrell Revis that once they have those injuries late in their career and they lose a little bit of their quickness and a little bit of, of their speed, uh, we kind of see them not really age well into their 30s. That if you are... Um, even someone like Richard Sherman, that was a predominantly zone cornerback, reading the quarterback's eyes, needing to understand route concepts and how a quarterback and an offense are trying to bait him, realizing where he needs to be on the field, and then just planning and driving on the ball. I think you can play longer and still be pretty good doing that. At 31, coming off a quad injury, I think it the market kind of indicated that, you know, I'm sure teams were interested in Stefan Gilmore, but they understand, hey, as a on an island, uh, shadow your number one receiver type of cornerback, he's just not as valuable today um, as he was even two or three years ago. Um, And again, the last time we saw him on the field, I think he was solid in 2020, but he was not anywhere close to the defensive player of the year he was the year before. I want to go to two more places with you here before uh, we let you get out of here. And um, the first one is... I tweeted it out this morning. I saw a clip of, of Baker Mayfield and it got me to thinking about, you know, we, we're a month in and, and kind of tearing, you know, the the contenders in the AFC. And I think that that's a, a fun exercise every every few weeks during the season. And then our, our good buddy Sneaky Joe on WGR actually had a segment on it as well today. And I thought we'd go around the horn here and figure out. I, I don't necessarily care so much past the top two tiers because I think that that's really the two the, the real contenders. But where you have everybody, because for me, as we sit here after four weeks, I have the Bills and the Chiefs in that top tier 
you know, the Super Bowl contenders, the, the teams that I really think have a chance to be in the AFC title game, and I would give them both a chance to win. I'm adding the Chargers to that group. I, I think I've seen enough of from them the first four weeks. I, I'm, I'm all in on Justin Herbert. I think he's an elite quarterback. I think that he's going to become even better over the course of the season. The belief I have in Herbert is why I, I up them up to that tier one. I think they have a lot of cool things going on in defense. They have playmakers on offense. I got Cleveland and Baltimore in tier two. I have questions about both of those quarterbacks. Where do you stand in terms of the uh, the hierarchy in the AFC right now? I view it pretty similarly. Like I was going to say the Chargers as that third team at this point. Um, I, I do think there is a little bit of like the primetime bias. Like everyone watched him like shred a pretty bad Raiders secondary on Monday night football, but I totally agree with you, Matt. Like he is on his way to being an elite quarterback and they have Derwin James. They have Joey Bosa. Um, their head coach is, is defensive minded. They, they try to limit big plays like Sean McDermott and the bills do, and they do it well. Um, I have the Browns and the Ravens also in that tier two. And I just believe in the Ravens more than the Browns because I think for as much as Lamar Jackson has his detractors and so does Baker Mayfield, I, I just feel like in a play in one game, Lamar Jackson can go off on the ground and make enough plays through the air to win you a couple of playoff games. And what I've seen from Baker Mayfield, um, especially like I, I just watched that game today, Browns and Vikings, whenever he is not – perfectly in a clean pocket scanning the field for four seconds if he has to throw on the run or he's trying to run away from a defensive end his pinpoint accuracy kind of goes out the window and I think eventually in the playoffs whether you're facing the Chargers or the Bills or maybe not so the Chiefs but you're going to face some good pass rushes mm -hmm. and Baker Mayfield I think in those situations that's kind of how I felt about him before the season that uh the Browns roster might be you know, a, a top three or top five roster in the NFL. And Baker Mayfield is a good quarterback, um, but I've, I've seen some issues with his ball placement and he just doesn't have that improvisational ability that Justin Herbert has, Patrick Mahomes has, Josh Allen has, and Lamar Jackson has. So I think that's what separates those four. And I would still put the Browns in tier two, but they're probably the fifth team at this point. Yeah, some some great points there, and I, I think we can all agree that Justin Herbert's well on his way to superstardom. Uh, could could you just imagine a team passing on Justin Herbert? You know, a team in the <laughs> AFC East, perhaps that's probably kicking themselves right now. But that's that's a nice little transition to what I'm going to get to you with now, Chris. Ryan Ryan loves to throw shade at like <laughs> certain teams. Like I could tell, like. Like, like if it's the Patriots or the Dolphins, like eh, the Jets too, anybody in the AFC East, Ryan will throw a little. A just little just a little. No, but AFC East, listen, Bills are three and one. You have three teams trailing them at one, uh, the Bills at one and three. I, I don't want to ask, is this division wrapped up now? But is there a, a, a legitimate contender to give the Bills a run for their money in this division in 2021? No. <laughs> Zero. Not a chance. Uh, everything from that, from the Buccaneers Patriots game. I love Chris Collinsworth. I think he's very, very good on Sunday night football, but all the praise he was heaping on Mac Jones. I just don't see it. I, I, I there was a few plays where he eluded pressure in the pocket. I was like, okay, that was a good drift away from pressure. You want to see that from a young quarterback. He looks like Trent Edwards to me, honestly, like the, the, he's not aggressive whatsoever. And Maybe that, you know, during parts of the Tom Brady era, that's what the Patriots wanted to do. It wanted to be death by a thousand paper cuts. But the Patriots are not that dynamic uh, in the receiver group, in their running back room. And Mac Jones just mentally is not Tom Brady. So the Patriots are not there for me. I think they're a tough out because their defense is good and Belichick certainly knows defense. The Jets are clearly rebuilding. And the Dolphins, I, I think... They have a huge problem at offensive line. Their quarterback situation isn't very good. And the defense has regressed. I mean, they turned the ball over a ridiculous amount last year. Had a couple of block punts. Uh, one was returned for a touchdown, a kick return, kick returns, and a lot of stuff like that. It was bound to not be as good of a defense. So I, I don't think there is any legitimate contender in the AFC East. The Bills have to just keep doing what they're doing, and I think they should clinch clinch this division uh relatively early on um i 
love your Mac Jones take. I I feel like what happens a lot of times. I was I saying this. I think I was doing it on on the on the Danger and Tagler show, where I was talking about like when we talk about some of the big teams in sports, the Lakers, the Yankees, the Patriots, the Cowboys. You know the the high profile players, the young players that they draft, or the big free agency signings. There's this yearning or need for to elevate them, even when it's not really happening. You know, and and any little glimmer of success, I feel like people kind of you know latch onto that. I mean, if Tom Brady was clicking in that game, if the weather was a little bit better, and he, and, and he was able to kind of get things going, that's a blowout. I was I came away from that game actually a little bit more unimpressed with Mac Jones, considering how bad Tampa's defense has been to start the season. And so listen, I, I'm not sitting here trying to pour out. I think Mac Jones has probably been the most, um, you know, passable rookie quarterback to this point. It's been a, it's been a bad year. I know Zach Wilson had a nice performance against the Tennessee Titans, but I think that's right on the money. I, I couldn't agree more. Let me ask you this before um, I get out of here. There was one more thing. Shoot, Ryan. I'm forgetting what my, my last thing was. This is why we write down outlines, Chris. It's fine. No, I, I can jump in as you're thinking. One other thing on Mac Jones um, in watching. I've watched all of his dropbacks because I'm doing young quarterback grades, first and second year mm. quarterbacks every Tuesday for CBSSports.com. And it, it's it's the obvious, like he's not being aggressive enough and he's completing a lot of passes, not taking a bunch of sacks, keeping the ball out of harm's way. That's fine, but eventually you need to try to make a tight window throw or you need to drop it in the bucket down the field. Like oh, There's only so long that you can last and operate your offense well. And he hasn't really scored a bunch of points either before you know teams are just biting, coming downhill. They're biting on those underneath routes and they're deflecting a lot of passes and intercepting a lot of passes. Uh, so it, it's easy to look at the stats and see a high completion percentage see how well they hung uh, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But like you mentioned, Matt, like that's that Buccaneer defense really banged up and has been very susceptible this season. So you're totally right that, that, that the shortstop after Derek Jeter, people wanted to make into Derek Jeter and he just wasn't Derek Jeter. And I, I think we're kind of seeing that a little bit early in this career for Mac Jones, because he hasn't really been that good doing difficult things that you need to do being an NFL quarterback. And I think there's a piece of it too, that, you know, you know, if you're covering the team, like, I mean, you're, you want to, you want a, an interesting, good player to cover too. And so I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, you saw, you find some of the things that they're doing well and kind of, you know, harp on it a little bit. It's, it is what it is, whatever. But I did remember the final thing that I want to talk to you about. I can't believe I forgot. Listen, we, it's not every every week that we have a draft expert on here. And I know there's a lot of excitement about what the Bills have going on in 2020. But I want to ask you, as we sit here and, and got, have a good look at this roster now, where would you put the – what would you – we get asked this a lot, like the top need for the Bills. And I, I usually kind of veer towards the offensive line because – just because of how the Bills have viewed the cornerback position. I know that you could probably always upgrade that CB2 spot. But, you know, I think, what, you know, if you're looking – you know, maybe at a first round pick next year, I think interior offensive line makes a lot of sense. Where do you feel like the Bills should go, you know, with that top pick or, you know, early in the draft and give us a player or two that you're watching that you think, you know, is worth watching for fans and somebody that you've liked so far in the college season. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I wish I had a different answer, uh, but it's got to be interior offensive line. And I think you can get late in the first round. Most likely you can still get a quality player at guard or at center, uh, not that I, I mean, I know there was that chorus early this offseason that the Bills should maybe cut Mitch Morse. I was not a believer in that, uh, but he is getting up there in age, whether it be Tyler Linderbaum from Iowa, who is probably going to be the consensus top center in the class, um, or Kenyon Green from Texas A&M, I think is the exact, he like fits the Brandon Bean profile of what they drafted in Carolina. He's a big masher from the SEC uh, is not going to have problems dealing with power early in his career. So those two, Kenyon Green from Texas A&M, can play tackle, can play guard, um, and then Tyler Linderbaum, if he lasts as long as to get down to the end of round one, to be that versatile, uh, very athletic, but still good with leverage and power center, uh, I think that would make the most sense to upgrade the bills right away for the short term, but also like plan for the future for Josh Allen. And I think that kind of played into the Spencer Brown 
uh, and the Tommy Doyle picks that they said, hey, we have our tackles, but we also have our quarterback, and we don't want to just protect him this year. We want him to be well protected well into this big contract that he do sign. Chris Trapasso, my friend, thank you so much for spending 45 with us on this Wednesday night. Some great stuff. We'll get you on again soon if you're open to it. We'll, we'll continue to mm-hmm, pump this sure. TikTok channel. Find them at Chris Trapasso <laughs> on TikTok. You're not going to be upset. And I know everybody's sitting there like my wife. She's like, I'm not going to download TikTok. And, but I'll see her on Instagram. And she's, she's scrolling through the videos on Instagram. They, they copy TikTok. Just, just, download the, just download the app. It's great content. That is the perfect segue. Get onto TikTok and follow me at Chris Trapasso. Thank you, guys. Great work. Uh, everything uh, NFL, uh, college football, the draft. Uh, Chris Trapasso is where you want to be. My friend, have a great week. Enjoy the game this weekend. You guys too. Thanks. All right. All right. So um, we're going to bring in uh, Sarah Holland here uh, to wrap up the show. But before we move on to the first topic here that Sarah's going to bring in, I wanted to stay on Mitch Morris for a quick second because I was looking at his contract uh, for next year. And Ryan, he's going to he's gonna come with a little bit more than an $11 million cap hit at 31 years old, um, it's interesting. Like, I think that you can restructure the contract. You could probably even kick the can down the road and, and extend them a year, uh, make ha- have a void year, or you know, put some money uh, in 2023. But the way that he's playing right now, I definitely think that you know, to 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 flip things to a, a brand new center, I think would probably be a little bit scary. I think you'd rather probably go for a high profile guard that's got position flexibility restructure the money a little bit. I think Mitch Morris has proven to be somebody that's willing to do that. The only thing that concerns me is the concussion history. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a valid concern and the concussions are worrisome. I mean, when the bills signed him, you, you saw uh, a few concussions a few years in a row. And in, in this league, I know he keeps saying, you know, I'm fine. He, he's passing all the neurological tests, obviously, but you don't just want to pass off the baton to someone just right out of the gate. Week one, uh, unless you're extremely confident in said player, whether it's via free agency or with your first round pick, uh, I think that the best plan of action there obviously is to uh, bring someone in via the draft, you know, learn under Mitch, maybe be someone that has that guard center versatility that can contribute as a rookie in that regard and be willing or be ready to step in if something were to happen in season. Here, Holland, how are you this evening? I'm great. How are you guys? We're great. What's going on? Um, First of all, I'd like to say if you're on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, We appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. And I actually want to bring in something that's not from the chat tonight. Um, I'm not sure if you have seen the video of Josh Allen mic'd up from this uh, past weekend's win over the Texans. But if you have not, please go watch it as soon as possible. Um, I think they posted it last night and I woke up this morning to my feed absolutely flooded with responses from uh, Bills fans. So I had to take a look myself and the uh, the video definitely lived up to the comments. Um, I had to actually stop watching it before class because I was laughing too hard. So um, I, I found two comments that I actually want to read really quickly that stood out to me. Um, one is, this. they're both on Twitter. So the first one's from at Superfly97. He said, I cannot believe that a grown man like me has so much admiration for such a young kid, but man, he is so cool and mature and a great leader. Like when I grow up, I want to be just like Josh Allen. And the next comment is from Twix Ritter. And he says, lots of great stuff here. Tons of laughs. And Allen is a good dude. Parts I liked aside from the laughs. Allen genuinely saying, I love you to Diggs at the end. Also the shout song became more special because now I know the players are down there singing the part we echoed. So make sure you go watch this video if you haven't already. Um, It's super awesome. And you know, after watching this video, all I have to say is what team has more fun than the Buffalo Bills? And I know, Matt, you're at the practices. Do you see the same things um, from this video at practice? Yes. Most days, like there, there's a couple moments usually that we're allowed to watch practice where, you know, the, you know, the defensive backs are, are, are dancing. Josh Allen is racing Davis uh, Webb on the sideline. Isaiah McKenzie's always must see TV when you're in the in the facility. But no, I thought that the, the video was funny. I was watching it last night uh, when it was released, and my wife was asking me what I was watching. And, um, you know, I was kind of going through it just to see uh, if there was any uh, compelling parts from the, the mic'd up th- th- series because sometimes these guys forget that they're mic'd up. And actually, mm-hmm. 
Stefan Diggs said today when we talked to him, you know, there was a time in there at the end where he went up to Josh Allen and says, I love you. You know what I mean? And, and he was asked about it and, and he was like, I'm not going to lie. I, I didn't know I was mic'd up. I forgot I was mic'd up. They told me at the beginning and then I forgot at the end. I didn't want you all to hear that, he said. So he was kind of like bashful about it. But then he went into it a little bit more and he's like, listen, I'm about bringing positivity. Like, uh, I think that, you know, it, it's born out of like positivity and genuine love. And obviously the relationship there, Ryan, between Stefan Diggs and Josh Allen. I mean, it, you didn't even need the, the 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 audio of that to realize the connection there. And I, And he also wants Josh to take care of something. He asked him if he got his ointment. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that was a great video and, and it was fun just to see the relationships between all the guys, not just Diggs and Allen, who, you know, are, are very special in that regard, but even Dawson Knox in the beginning when Josh Allen was going to doing the one, two, three deal and he messes up Dawson Knox was ragging on him, giving him a hard time about it uh, before the game uh, in the huddle. You, you know, you saw Spencer Brown swat a hornet off of Allen and, and you get to see mm -hmm. Allen's response to that and just how, how he is with his teammates. These guys genuinely care about one another. And I think that's a little element that is really important to the long-term success of a team. You, you can win year, year in, year out. If you have certain franchise players, especially a quarterback, but I think that the teams that do the best for the longest amount of time are those that are really close knit, always spending time together. And this is what that this team is, whether you're talking all together or the defense hanging out with the defense, uh, the Poyer and Hyde type relationship. This is just a, one of those teams, special teams that you're going to look back on if you're a Bills fan years from now and say, you know, they, they not only were, were entertaining to watch on the field, but they, they also genuinely cared about one another and, and the success of the team more than the, the, the me attitude that you see sometimes in some players. One thing that I wanted to talk about real quick before we get out of here, you know, we're going to preview uh, this game uh, a little bit more in-depthly on Friday before I head to KC on Saturday. But, you know, we can go around the horn. We'll start with Ryan here. Where do you put this game in terms of what it means for the Bills season? You know, it, it well, the big thing coming out of, you know, Orchard Park today is like, this is the biggest game because it's the next game and it's one of 17 and we're treating it just like any other game. But for me, you know, and I'll let you start off here, but like, I don't feel like this is just another game. No, without it, it's not even close to just another game. It, the Bills had a very special season last year, getting all the way to the AFC championship game. But there's some questions in season about, you know, could, what, what could they do come playoff time? Because they had those bad losses or a, a loss to the Chiefs, a loss to the Titans and these other contenders. I think the Bills need one of those statement wins this season, whether it's against Kansas City this week or later on in the season uh, against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the the two teams that were in last year's Super Bowl. I think it, it's just really important to show, listen, you know, this isn't just a team that can make it far into the AFC playoffs. This is a team that can win the conference, go to the Super Bowl and make a statement in that game. So this is far from another game. Uh, I think it's important for Josh and, and the team as a whole, just like it was for Lamar Jackson a few weeks ago to prove to go and, and play a game and prove that, hey, you know, we can go in and we can defeat this Kansas City Chiefs team. Uh, there, There is some kryptonite in terms of being able to find a way to beat them, and I think the Bills being more balanced on offense bodes well for them. Uh, I think this defense seems to be, like I said earlier, the, the best that they've been under Leslie Frazier and Sean McDermott. Now, mind you, they're not giving, they're not getting Davis Mills or Taylor Heineke or, or Jacoby Brissett this week, so they're going to give up some points. They're going to give up some yards. But I, I think the ability to create some turnovers and to get a little bit of heat on Patrick Mahomes is there. And if they can get one turnover, if they can get the Chiefs off the field a, a few times, obviously more than they did in that championship game, the Bills are going to have a legitimate shot to go on the road and steal a, a, you know, a game that they're, they're the slight underdogs in. How about you, Sarah? Yeah, I think what happens like when I think of is that one picture of, you know, Stefan Diggs uh, after last game watching the confetti fall. And I think that just shows how big of a game, you know, this is this weekend. Obviously, it's not just another game. And I think that mindset, you know, Stefan Diggs is probably going to remember exactly that feeling that he had coming off of that that loss to them last season. So um, I expect them, you know, to come in, still have the fun that they were having, you know, last game. But definitely um, – you know, be a little bit more serious and uh, be excited for this game. Yeah, I, um, you know, this, there's so much about this game that's important, you know, from 
what it means if they win, what what I feel like it, it reassures them of what they are, because I feel like we've seen them establish that in big games over the course of the last year plus now. But this is like this is the big fish right in the big pond. You take them out and not only does it give you that that self-confidence that you are as good as everybody is trying to say that you are, but also. I mean, Ryan, this is a pivotal game in the conference that if this comes down to week 17 and it's the difference between going through Kansas City to the Super Bowl or staying at home in Buffalo to get there, you got to sell out in this game. You can't have a you know Sean McDermott situation where you're tentative on fourth down inside the 10 yard line. You got to look at your quarterback, Josh Allen, like like John Harbaugh did to Lamar Jackson a couple weeks ago and say, hey, you think we should go for it on fourth down? Go. There can't be any indecisiveness you have to go into this game with a plan set you gotta you have gotta have confidence in your players what you do well and let them execute it yeah aggressiveness is key for the offense on on sunday you you look at both of the losses that the chiefs have this year and you even go to that chargers game fourth and four uh when the the chargers could have kicked a field goal they say they're going to go for it they get penalized for a false start it's fourth and nine now you think okay they're definitely going to go for the long field goal no they, they go for it they get a pass interference penalty and then they could have brought the clock all the way down pretty much to zero and tried it for a chip shot field goal they said no we're going to score a touchdown and then we're going to we'll give the ball back to him with a certain amount of time knowing that he has to go all the way down the field score a touchdown i don't know if i necessarily agree with it from that point in terms of maybe kicking the last second field goal to win it versus that but the aggressiveness there. You mentioned the aggressiveness in, in that Ravens game. The Bills can't go down deep into the field and settle for field goals in this game. Uh, th- this is just one of those matchups where the Bills need to make sure that if you know if they feel like they're in a, a range to go for it, whether that's fourth and four, fourth and seven, and they're on uh, near midfield, near the 40, whatever the case may be, you know, go. These are the games you need to show that there's no fear in this team, that you believe in this offense, that you believe in this line, the run game, the list goes on and on. You you can't cower away. The Bills were really aggressive last year for a lot of the season. Then come that championship game for whatever reason, they they took the foot off the gas a little bit and and they were they were settling for field goals early in that game. And, and it wasn't the team that you you saw uh throughout the regular season. The Bills need to be aggressive on Sunday night. Funny enough, guys, Andy Reid is in the comments right now saying, uh, thanks for giving me Patrick Mahomes. Um, I think that's obviously uh, alluding to the fact that the Bills traded the number 10 pick uh, in the draft a few years ago, and Patrick Mahomes uh, went to the Chiefs. Listen, I, you know, that gets brought up every time the Bills and the Chiefs play. I, I think it's worked out pretty well for both franchises, um, and obviously it's a joke. It's not actually Andy Reid, if you're listening on the – the audio platforms, but just having a little fun uh, here on this uh, Wednesday night, a uh, couple days out from uh, Sunday night football, uh, Buffalo bills, Kansas city chiefs. We will have our full game preview potentially with a guest. Maybe it'll just be my, myself and Ryan. We'll see. Uh, but we're brought to you as always by tops friendly markets. Are you hosting a large party this weekend for the big game? Check out tops huge selection of party platters for delicious effortless an affordable, no stress way to impress. For complete details, stop by their carryout cafe or visit topsmarkets.com slash fantasy foodball. That's F O O D B A L L. And actually, Bruce Nolan uh, and Nate Geary, they have their uh, what's that? What's their show called on Friday nights? Where um, food for thought? Food for thought. Yeah. And they were saying we should have called the, uh, something about foodball. And uh, we know foodball or something. And I'm like, listen. And that's already being talked about on the tops uh, friendly market sponsored shout football podcast. So easy guys. Oh, and before we get out of here, KC week, shout out uh, to our guy, Therese Paler, rest in peace. Uh, always keeping uh, his name alive. He did our show right before the AFC title game last year. Absolutely was sensational. So I'm going to be rocking this uh, this week. I'll bring it down to Kansas city too. Uh Yeah, man, we missed the guy. All right. uh, For Sarah Holland, Ryan Talbot, I am Matt Perino. We will be back on Friday. Enjoy your week, everyone. Take care.